Hey, everybody, and thank you for tuning in to this installment of Return to Base. I'm your host, Cliff. Today's guest is somebody who I'm very excited about, somebody who has an absolutely amazing story. Uh, I actually had a chance to serve with him a long, long time ago in Afghanistan, and very excited to announce today's guest is Nate Boyer. Nate Boyer is an in addition to being a Green Beret and a veteran, he was a walk-on long snapper at the University of Texas. Uh, and from there, he actually signed as an undrafted free agent by the Seattle Seahawks in 2015. I got to pause there. This is something pretty incredible. Think about this. He was a Green Beret first and then went off to college to the University of Texas. Walked on, by the way, as a long snapper at the University of Texas, having never played a single down of organized football ever, not in Pop Warner, not in high school, shows up at a Division I school with the audacity to say, hey, I want to make this team. And he did. Rest is history. Uh, in addition to that, he's been a fisherman part of his life. He's been an actor. He is an actor, actually. He's an actor, producer, director, a philanthropist. He co-founded an organization called Merging Vets and Players, something that we'll get a chance to talk to him about, I'm sure. And above all else, he's just a really good human being, a really good American, and we're proud to have him on this episode of Return to Base. So stay tuned. And if you hadn't already, go ahead and click that subscribe button uh, to get more content like this. So stay tuned. Here we go. Bravo Zulu, this is Victor Lima. We are RTB. This is Return to Base, a Better in Life podcast. All right. Got a good guest today, Nate Boyer, uh, former Green Beret, NFL. Un, undrafted free agent in 2015 by the Seattle Seahawks. How's it going, Nate? It's pretty good. How are you doing? Doing pretty good. Thanks. Thanks for asking. Um, we got a lot to cover. Obviously, you've had an interesting life. Uh, some might say you're a, a bit of a renaissance man. Um, I, I kind of liken it a little bit to Forrest Gump. <laughs> no offense, you know, <laughs> just kind of running around doing everything, man. Kind of, kind of in the... Uh, kind of the pop culture, if you will, or do, doing a little bit of everything in this, in this, um, this century here. Right. Yeah. I don't so, know about everything, but kind of <laughs> trying, trying to do, do the things that I'm into or at least attempt them. And yeah. Um, yeah. I'll tell yeah. you what, you've done more than most people. That's for sure. If I look at your resume, we, we brought it up during the, the intro, but um, obviously you have a very impressive resume and, and one, one can probably say that you've lived a pretty full life. How do you feel about that? Uh, you know, I, I think it's a, a matter of perspective. It's, it's like the only life you really understand is your own. Right. <laughs> so for me, it feels kind of, feels kind of normal. And of course, like, I don't know about a co- of course, but it, for me, it feels like I haven't done that much or I put maybe too much time into things and, that I don't really care about and wish I would have put more time into other things. And, but I think that's probably standard with everybody. I bet everybody's got those type of, uh, I don't want to say regrets, but regrets, <laughs> you, know, you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. I know what you mean. And, and you, you mentioned something that I always like to tell people when committing to, to things is time is my only resource. I can't really renew. Uh, so I'm pretty protective of my time and I know you're protective of your time. And so I, I do appreciate you taking the time to talk to us, but your, your point there being that the time that you have had to spend on this world, you, you maybe could have did some things a little bit differently. Is that what you're saying? Uh, yeah. I, you know, I just, I often feel like that I just, you know, wasted a bit of time doing doing something that wasn't, uh, that I wasn't really set on, um, yeah. more, more earlier in life. 
it's probably right. because I didn't really know what I wanted to do. But at the same time, like I have to understand that because I spun my wheels for a bit, I think it got me to a place of frustration and asking a lot of questions. And that's probably what spurred um, the action that was taken after that. So, right. you know, I, it, it's one of those things, like it's a catch 22, I think. Right. But, uh, it's hard to rec it's hard to always recognize it. Mm -hmm. You know, you're, you know, I'm 40 years old now. It's like, uh, as you know, life keeps going and you're like, ah, oh, man, I never did that thing. And I'm not, uh, I wish I was doing this thing right now. And I'm also not, uh, slowing down and enjoying my life at all. And, right. You know, I mean, it's, uh, it, it's like the, they're definitely first world, world problems, like all those things, but um, well, you would know, yeah. right? So, for those uh, um, those listening who don't know, I mean, you you visited the third world, and uh, obviously during combat, but also before your time in the military. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. In two thousand four, uh, it was my first time going to going to a, a place like that. I went to the Darfur in uh, in the along the border of Chad and Sudan. What led, um, what led you to do that? Well, I was a, honestly, it was a time magazine article. I was 23 years old at the time. Um, you know, nine 11 happened when I was, was like 19, 20, nine 11 happened when I was 20. And I thought about joining the military at the time, but you know, it just didn't quite feel right. I didn't know what I would do exactly. And I just, I guess I, I mean, none of us were aware that this was going to be a long war, right. not to mention a, you know, a 20 year war, but, uh, that's right. So I just, I, you know, I, I, I always, I remember thinking of that when I was younger, I was like, well, I'd only really join, probably join the military if we were, if we were at war and it was something pretty, you know, mm -hmm. pretty, pretty big, pretty, pretty involved. And so I, uh, I, I, I didn't do that. And, uh, and I, but I, I did a lot of other things that when I talk about the wasting of time <laughs> where I just right. felt like 18 to 23, what were you up to, man? Come on. <laughs> yeah, exactly. 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 Uh, not going to college. I'll, I'll tell you that much, but, uh, <laughs> yeah. And, and, and so I remember this, just reading this article and it was like, just, it just like hit me the images they just struck me in a certain way and i was like man i gotta go over there and, and help and it was like i mean the title was the title of the time magazine article was the tragedy in sudan mm. and it was uh yeah it was just these people that are you know in the midst of a genocide right three hundred thousand three hundred thousand people had been killed by the time i'd read that article uh and it was mostly women and children that were sort of left um, abandoned and ended up in refugee camps and they were understaffed and they just needed help. They needed people. And so I just made the decision, even though I was not qualified at all. And through the Peace Corps? No, I actually didn't. I couldn't go with any organization. They wouldn't let me because oh. I didn't have a college degree and I didn't have any special wow. skills or anything. So I just like, I just flew myself over there and like figured it out when I got there. Yeah, I was really stupid, but. Um, wow, man. Know, <laughs> but you just show up in Sudan and you, uh, I, I imagine you went to maybe the rental car place or, or somewhere. Say, hey, point, point me to where all the bad stuff yeah. is happening and yeah. you know, see if I can go help. Yeah. Wow. I got it. Picked up, picked up a Ford Focus at Enterprise rental car and just threw it. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. There was, uh, you know, not a lot of English spoken. Right. Um, in the capital, uh, Jemena is the name of the capital of Chad where I flew into. That's about the only place you could fly into anywhere near the Darfur. And I, uh, I talked my way onto a UN flight, kind of BS my way on this little, the UNHCR, uh, United Nations High Commission for right. Refugees, um, little prop plane. They had an extra, an open seat. I, I just kind of BS my way on it and flew, flew across the Sahara to, to the Darfur. And, um, once I got there, uh, I, I talked my way into a volunteer opportunity. I mean, I wasn't asking for anything, including wow. food or being put up. You know, I was like, yeah. I just want to help. And so I ended up sleeping. Um, you know, I, I kind of slept 
how the refugees slept. I just slept on the ground, you know, and under a, not even really under a tent. It was like this back of this like extended compound. And, um, but I, 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 I assisted every day with, you know, in the medical centers, I played soccer with the kids. I helped build some of the, the, you know, the campsites and stuff like that. And, um, it was just a, a grunt as far as the, uh, refugee camp world goes. <laughs> wow. And, and, uh, but it just, you know, completely changed my life and perspective on things. And, um, it really made me, um, my, my patriotism was sort of gained over there. So many people were just enamored with America. They just wanted to talk about America and hear about my stories. And like, why would I, you know, why would I leave that to come over here and help? And, you know, um, and, uh, I, I just made the decision when I was there that I was going to join the military. So, um, did you become an 18 Delta? Is that right? A, a special forces medical Sorry. Uh, echo echo. Oh, you're echo. A com- yeah. Com- yeah. yeah. Should have yeah. known that. I didn't sign up for that. I wanted to be an engineer. I wanted to be a Charlie, but I think echo is what they gave me because they, they needed echoes at the time. I, I scored pretty well on some of the, um, some of the tests, you know, right. I guess that, uh, that would qualify me better as an echo as, which mm-hmm. is a combo guy for those that don't know, but it wasn't super into it. And I didn't know anything about it. Man. I didn't, didn't even have an email address when I joined the military. So it was all, it was all very new to me. You know? So you're in um, Darfur and you're thinking, did you, I mean, did you run into some special forces guys in Africa? And no, Africa? there was no, there was no American military anywhere near where I was uh, at all. There was, they had uh, some like UN soldiers, but uh, maybe French foreign legion was there as well, mm. but not, uh, no, no, no American. Well, I don't want to say no. None that I saw. Right. Probably right, was right. somewhere. Did you consider joining the French Foreign Legion? No, I didn't. I, I you know, I, I, uh, I didn't even know what I was going to do exactly coming back. I just knew it had to be something like that. Like as, these people, I just felt like were worth fighting for. And I, I got malaria the last week I was there. Oh, good. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, so that was super fun. Uh, but the, uh, the family that put me up and like took care of me, they put a little radio in the room I was staying. And, um, it, uh, the only station that came on the radio was the BBC mm. and the, like the second battle of Fallujah was happening at that time. Right. Um, I think that's November, it's October or November of 2004, I think November. And, uh, and I'm like listening to the play by play of these guys, mostly Marines going in and. Um, you know, risking their lives and fighting for these people. And uh, I just thought, man, that's, that's what I'm going to do next. I'm going to join the military. So I came home, went to the Marine, Marine Corps recruiting office, didn't get a great vibe from that. And <laughs> also like, wasn't sure if that made sense. That was the right fit. And then I, I came across this other Mark magazine article that talked about the 18 x-ray programs. Um, I think it was also a time magazine, honestly, uh, wow. but it was, yeah, I, I was like getting my oil change at a, at a, you know, a dealership and just very like kind of sitting there in the dealership, which is, I remember it pretty clear, probably cause that's where I read that article, but mm. I just remember being like, Oh, like I'm back to the, back to the real world, you know, the hum of the, the hum of the lights inside of <laughs> the empty waiting room. And, uh, I, I, I was reading about how you could come in off the street and sounds like you were just drawn at that point to, to service. You knew you had to to serve, it sounds like, and and you had this inclination spurred on by maybe a re renewed patriotism as to how the rest of the world sees the United States of America. Is is that accurate? Yeah, I think so. I mean, like I was proud of a lot of the, uh, like, honestly, after nine 11, I just remember, you know, nine 12, like, and I lived in LA at the time and it was like, people were marching in the streets, like parading, you know, dressed as uncle Sam and stuff like that. And it was just like, <laughs> kind of something we, we don't, you know, it almost be, if we saw that today, people would assume Freak out. it was like a, 
extremist group. Yeah. You know that, isn't that wild when you think it's about very, that? It's, it's very wild. It's very wild. But it was, you know, it was just like, you know, we were very united. Like came, really came together. And then I remember, you know, like, like, like George Bush throwing the first pitch out of the, at the world series, right. you know, in the, in the, I guess it was in the Yankee stadium. And it's just like all those kind of things. It's just like, dang, this is crazy. You know, this is, this is like I'm really proud of this. Like, mm. I don't know. It was just yeah. interesting. I was uh, after nine 11 or during nine 11, actually, I was, I was stationed in Germany at the time. So it was, an interesting feeling. Germans were leaving flowers at our base, which was far from any type of danger. Yeah. But, um, and I, re- I remember that speech he gave George W. Bush at the uh, Ground Zero, where yeah, those uh, firemen said, "Hey, we can't hear you." And, and then, of course, he said, "I can hear you." And and pretty soon, the people who knocked down these buildings are going to hear from all of us. That was like, right. yeah, that was a real proud moment. And then, of course. You know, I know you're a big baseball fan, so am I. So that whole um, first pitch, I'm sure you've seen the 30 for 30 about it. I think it's a 30 for 30 about the first pitch where Jeter says, don't bounce it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. They yeah. always say that. I, I got to throw a first pitch out of a, it was a uh, spring training game for the, right. for, the Marin- for the Mariners. But yeah, same thing. They were like all, the main thing, they're like aim high. So like if you miss high and the catcher has to come up, like no big deal. Just don't bounce it. You know? So <laughs> I was like staring at the top of the catcher's mask and I was like, all right, I'm, 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 if I miss high, if I, if I throw it over his head, that's fine. I'm just did, uh, did you throw it from the rubber. Oh yeah. Nice. Yeah, I, you, uh, gotta, you, you gotta do it. Oh dude, I did the full windup. I threw it as hard as I could. <laughs> I mean, it probably went like 65 miles an hour, but like, you know, <laughs> I did threw it as hard as I could. I was, I wasn't messing around. <laughs> Yeah. So, so, um, so you become a green beret and for the, for the listeners, uh, Nate and I actually served together in, in Afghanistan. And, uh, I don't know, I guess it has to be 2013 or 14. Long yeah, time so, 13, 2013. Yep. Uh, and, um, didn't get to know each other too well. I, I was kind of all over the place as were you d- doing different things. I was, by the way, I was at 18 echo as well. Um, oh, nice. before, before I got promoted to, uh, yay. But, um, you know, that experience, what, what did you think about your time in Afghanistan? That wasn't your only time in Afghanistan, correct? No, I went to, uh, well, actually just went to Afghanistan that year. And I went the next year I was at Camp Moorhead with third group and right. she got attached, attached to an ODA. Um, but I was in Iraq before that when I was in 10th group on active duty. Mm, yeah um both places special place in my heart for both big shout out to <laughs> to iraq spent, i spent a lot of time in iraq where whereabouts in iraq and and how, how did you find those those trips to, um while working on an oda and and just those deployments especially knowing now that afghanistan's done and iraq is kind of you know always in a state of mess yeah. Yeah. It's tough to see, man. I mean, I, I was in, uh, in Iraq. I was, we operated mostly out of Najaf. That's where our team mm-hmm. house was, which is, uh, South of Baghdad. It's right where the Tigris and Euphrates sort of converge. And, um, it's near, you know, Babel, right. um, ba- or as we know, it's Babylon, you know, the, and, uh, Najaf was the Shiite holy city, which has the mm-hmm. biggest cemetery in the world. So it's like a lot of uh, religious significance for honestly, for all religions. Uh, or all main ones, major ones, I should say, Judaism, um, Chris, Christianity and, and, uh, yeah, exactly. And, uh, and Islam, but, uh, yeah, father Abraham's, uh, buried there and many, many others, um, probably millions of others. Um, that is a huge cemetery. It, it's enormous it, to, to think of the, um, uh, the battles that went on in that cemetery in, yeah. 2000 early or late 2000s. There was a big one in 07, um, right. right before we got there with the Marines. I think four Marines were killed. Um, and yeah, our, our ODA, we never got in a firefight in the cemetery, but I just remember, I mean, we spent a lot of time around there, and, mm. uh, but it was just, it was, it was very bizarre. I mean, to see something like that, because 
Najaf, it's a city, but it's nothing like a city in North America or the West generally. It's just very desolate. It's very, I mean, you're in the desert and um, even that sort of downtown, you know, everything's sort of sand colored, <laughs> all the bu- all the buildings, very dusty. There's a lot of like windstorms and um, it's not like, a, so a lot of Iraq is very different. That, in, in some ways it was almost like more like Southern Afghanistan, um, you know, the, yeah. the topography and everything. So, uh, but it was, and it was like, we were very far from everyone else. I mean, there was a, a nearby like sort of supply base, but we were far from the flagpole. Um, mm-hmm. I don't know the, the closest ODA to us was in Hilla, which right. I think that was at least an hour drive. if not more. I can't remember. What year was, but what year was that? This is in oh, 2008, 2009. Oh yeah. yeah. I, um, 2009, I was out East at Kut. Oh yeah. In 2010. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah, same like Baghdad, big city, still on the outskirts, sandcastles, <laughs> Najaf, yeah. even worse. Put, I mean, you can just see across, there's no real big buildings. Um, but yeah, the and then then Afghanistan, obviously, you it sounds like you you've been a fair amount of places in Afghanistan, and and it's weird to see kind of, I don't know you could say our legacy, our, our generation's legacy kind of in question in some ways uh, with, especially with Afghanistan falling the way it did. And then obviously Iraq had uh, the ISIS uprising and stuff. Um, right. Yeah. No, it's sad. You know, it's, it's, it's frustrating, but it's not really an easy answer there. So, right. yeah. uh, you know, I, I, I uh, those folks have been at war a long time, man. <laughs> I don't know if, yeah. if, if we thought we could could change that, um, but for for all the people there on the ground, the families and, and children, yeah, that's the worst part, man. Now. It's like there's that's what people don't quite understand. I think and you can't really do there, but I mean, I guess you can at some level. But just if you, if you I think people just don't believe it. That right. the, the amount the amount of oppression that exists over there, and like how women and children are treated um Mm -hmm. and you know just that um the class system um Mm -hmm. you know obviously things are not perfect here in the states right things are not completely equal for everybody but like it's just a completely different level of that and um, it's a it's quite a perspective when you look at it um yeah and, and you i mean I, d- I did several deployments to Iraq and just one to Afghanistan, but um, <clears throat> more or less people are people everywhere where there's just folks a lot of times trying to get by. Sometimes even the people whose houses I've been into, you realize this is just a guy trying to provide for his family. Right. Um, and put, put yourself in that same situation. You might do the same thing. Who knows? Um, yeah, exactly. But you know what? One thing that really tripped me out was the um, families seem to sleep in the first room of a house during, um, like, I guess the fall. And we would always come in to, you know, bad guy's house and just so afraid that I was going to step on a baby's arm or something like that. Mm, as we're yeah. In. And, you know, that, yeah, I'm I'm there to do a job, and I was also always concerned that oh man, I don't want to step on a kid's foot or something. Some baby's sleeping and wake him up. But right, yeah. Um, so when when we served together, uh, I remember somebody telling me like, hey, you sh- you should go talk to Nate, man. He's got an interesting story. Uh, and then found out, of course, that you you know on your on your free time, you were a long snapper for the Texas Longhorns. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I mean, that, that's crazy thing. No, you got it backwards. My free time. I was, that's right. Uh, in a national guard, you know? <laughs> yeah. 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 That's right. Um, <laughs> now, I mean, that is such 
a strange turn of events where you were in the in the Darfur. Before that, you worked on a fishing boat, decided to join the army, decided to go into the National Guard, and then I don't know, on a whim, you were like, you know what? I bet I can, I bet I can snap this football 20 yards. <laughs> well, I I uh growing up, I was always just a huge football fan. And um when I was, you know, a little kid, I played soccer and baseball and basketball. And, and then uh when I became interested in playing football, at first, my, you know, my mom wasn't thrilled about it just because it's, you know, I mean, it's a violent sport. And I was pretty young when I first was sort of into it. And so she, you know, she sort of steered me away from it. And um, and then I just got so hooked on especially baseball and basketball. I was like really into it. Um and then by the time I got to high school, it was like, man, you gotta, I gotta focus on these sports if I wanna, you know, if I want a chance to to start and play. Like I can't, I can't, I'm not a good enough athlete to just right. play four four sports or whatever in high school. So I uh never played and it like kind of bothered me. It was like a regret I had <laughs> for my my whole life till I was 29. I decided <laughs> to go back to college. <laughs> 29 but, uh, year on red shirt freshman. Yeah. Yeah. So I was, I was actually finishing up a deployment, that deployment in Iraq in 09. I was 28 at the time then. And I kind of just made the decision that uh, I wasn't going to reenlist on active duty. On active duty. I was a year out, you know, and so I was up for that reenlistment. I said, no, I'm not, I'm just going to go to college and, and, uh, uh, you know, go try to play football and ended up going to UT and, um, I, I, by, after my first semester there, I, I re-enlisted into the national guard because I wanted to, I wanted to keep serving. And, mm -hmm. you know, that first summer I had at school, I was bored to tears and I was <laughs> like, man, I need, I need to do something over the summer here. So, um, and, uh, yeah, so I, I, I walked on as a safety and, uh, I was, on, I made the team and I was on the scout team and I was dressed for home games and, you know, got to run down on kickoff coverage during the veteran's day game and all that stuff. But right. it was like, I want to play like meaningful snaps. I want to find a way on the field. Um, what's something that I can learn that's sort of a specialized skill that it doesn't necessarily, I don't necessarily have, have to have played football my whole life, right. you know, and, and long snapping kind of made the most sense. I mean, um, uh, it's a thankless job and it, you know, it's, it's like shooting a free throw in mm -hmm. the sense of it's the same every time it's kind of a close okay. skill like that, but it's not easy. I mean, you're hiking a ball through your legs, 15 yards. It's gotta be on a line, you know, a spiral and very you're accurate. About to get hit. And, yeah. And then you're about to get hit as soon as you do it. Exactly. It's, and if you saw screw Belichick up, you know, talk about it recently, Oh really? For like, for like 20 minutes. Well, some reporter <laughs> asked, Hey, do you think we need to, uh, you think you guys need a long snapper on, on the Patriots or can you do without? And he went into like a 15 minute explanation and history of the long snapper. Uh, it was that's a, that's a very, that's a very dumb question by the media there. Well, you, you know, the media is not all, all that bright. <laughs> yeah. Right. I mean, every, every NFL team has one, they have no backup, but they have right. one long snapper and that's all that person does. Punts, field goals, extra points. Mm -hmm. Um, and they don't play anything else. They're not a, they're not like, you know, but usually the backup for the long snapper in case he gets hurt is like, uh, you know, a reserve tight end or a linebacker or something like that. But yeah, yeah. it's just, uh, that's what that is. And so what was that like? So, All yeah, of a sudden I, you're like, you're lined up against, I don't know, 250, 300 pound, pound you know, mountain of man ready to hit you in your face as soon as you right. lose that ball. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's definitely nerve wracking, uh, but it's also just football and it's not that right. big a deal. I think that, I think the time in the military definitely helped me settle into those moments and nobody's shooting at you. Nobody's shooting at you. That was the first thing Mac told me. So my very first game that I played in, that I started in, um, was my sophomore year. It was after week one, I'd won the starting job in practice because week one, they, they recruited this kid to come in and be the long snapper. And he kind of had a tough, he didn't have a great game. I mean, it's, you know, there's a hundred thousand fans in the stadium. There's a lot 
if you're yeah. into it. So skill only takes you so far. And uh, he, he uh, gave me a shot. And the very first snap I go out there and I was nervous, man. And it was, you know, it was kind of a wobbly snap on an extra point. And, you know, the, the holder got it and put it down and they kicked it, you know, kicked it through, but it was, it's probably the worst snap of my career, to be honest, uh, <laughs> at, le- at least on field goals and extra points. And I knew I screwed it up, man. I come over the sideline and, and Mac just grabs me. He's like, Hey, you know, I was like, what? And he's like, nobody's shooting at you, you know, <laughs> relax. And I was like, all right. Yeah. That probably meant so. a lot. Yeah. No, I did. And then I go over to the sideline and I'm like, I'm like, yeah, that's such a good point, man. Just like, what are you by, doing? Just by relax. Mac. And who are you talking about here? Are you talking about Matthew Mac. Connie? No, Mac Brown. Oh, Mac Brown. Okay. The head, okay. The head coach. That, yeah. Okay. <laughs> and I know that, that, uh, McConney, uh, he's on the sideline quite a bit. No, but it wasn't, yeah. Yeah, it was that been funny. That would almost been a funnier story. Like, hey, man, nobody's yeah. shooting at you, but it'd be a lot cooler if they were. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That would be what he said. What he would say. Yeah, um, I, I know we're we're running up on time here, but I I, I kind of want to get through just a couple more things if that's all right. Yeah, you, yeah, yeah. Let's do it. <clears throat> yeah. Um. So, um. I mean, you've you've had such an interesting life. It's hard to wrap it up into such a small format, but uh, drafted, not drafted, but signed by the Seattle Seahawks. Did you have any inclination that this was going to happen? Um, no, not by the Seahawks specifically, but I, you know, I, 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 I remember, uh, you know, thinking after my senior year, like, this is probably it. This is probably my last game. We lost the bowl game to Arkansas pretty bad. And, uh, you know, didn't, didn't play great. And it was, it was a little like bittersweet. It's like, I wish we, you know, even if we lost the game, I wish we would have played better. It would have been some kind of an epic finale to the, to my career. And it really wasn't. <laughs> and, uh, and then I, uh, I, I got asked to play in the senior all-star game in Charleston called the medal of honor bowl. And, uh, it was, it doesn't even exist anymore, but every year they've got about three or four senior all-star games. They've always got the Reese's senior bowl and the East West shrine game and the NFL, NFL PA bowl. And then the fourth one is kind of a rotating one that the different places. And this one was like sponsored by the medal of honor society. And that's probably why they called me straight up because it was like, well, we want to have a veteran in the game, you know? Right. And so not a whole they lot of them in, in the no, no, there was one other when I was playing, um, one other that I knew of, one other uh, veteran in, in college football, and that's it. Um, and so I go down to Charleston. Uh, I, uh, uh, during the week of practices, they've got like all these NFL scouts there. And uh, I just didn't realize that was a thing. You know, most of the guys I was, that were in this game were at best middle round draft picks. And some, a lot of them were, you know, undrafted types like myself. Right. And uh, so I go down um, during the practices, like uh, they had during that week of practices, I should say they had time set aside for interviews you know, and teams would sit down with you and talk to you and whatnot. I had four different teams uh, sit with me and express interest. Uh, none of them were the Seahawks, but uh, um, yeah, it was like, uh, it was like the dolphins, the bears, the Cardinals. You know, you're thinking, the thinking still Browns, this is a long shot. Like that. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I definitely think this is a, definitely, a, definitely. You know, a they're just shot. going through the motion, man. They're here. They might as well interview somebody. Is that what you were yeah. thinking? Um, I mean, initially, but a couple of them were like giving me, they were like, you need to put some weight on, but you know, you're a good snapper. You should, you should go for it. Um, and so I was like, all right. So I did, I put on like 30 pounds (laughs) over the next four, four months. Um, it wasn't all good weight, but it was necessary (laughs) to to even get considered, you know, cause I, when I, in college, I played it like between 185 and 195. I was not big. Yeah. And that's like, that's like my fighting weight though. That's like, how right. <laughs> that's what I feel good at, you know? And, uh, I mean, right now I'm like 175 and I feel great, <laughs> Yeah, yeah. but you know, these at that time, I, I mean, I got all the way up to 225 
uh, when I was, uh, when I was prepping and uh, I did pro day and I had a good pro day out at Texas, like mm-hmm. just, uh, you know, ran a 40 and did the bench press and did the, uh, uh, long snap for the coaches and all that. And then mm-hmm. draft day rolls around and my agents talking to a few different teams and, um, I ended up, uh, ended up talking to, um, uh, or getting a call from the St. Louis Rams, uh, first and then, uh, the Seattle Seahawks and, and both teams were interested in signing me as a free agent. Like as soon as the draft was over and, so I kind of had to make a decision there. I had about 30 minutes to make, to choose. And wow. uh, the, the, uh, I mean, the, the Seahawks had been to back-to-back Super Bowls, you know, they won in, they won in, in 13, lost in 14. And um, I mean, it was Russell Wilson and Marshawn Lynch yeah. and Richard Sherman and uh, uh, Doug Baldwin and Bobby Wagner and Michael Bennett. I mean, Cam Chancellor, Earl Thomas, just on and on and on, just studs. Jimmy Graham just got acquired. And uh, I just was like, man, this is, this is a no brainer. Like I got to go, I got to go to the Seahawks. I mean, the Rams were struggling, you know, I think they won like four games the year before. And mm-hmm. I knew I probably had a better shot of making it in St. Louis, but I just couldn't turn down the opportunity to play in Seattle. Yeah. And so, yeah. So I went out, uh, I, 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 Pete Carroll called and I answered and said and that I wanted to, that I was down. I wanted to sign with the Seahawks. And so I signed as a free agent. I'm at 34 years old. <laughs> wow. What a, what a freaking inspiration story that is. I, and I remember watching it on TV and thinking, Oh my God, I know that guy. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and, and super proud of, of what you accomplished there. I mean, I mean, just even getting a call from an NFL team. That's a big deal, but yeah, not everybody, it, man. not everybody uh, treat you in the locker room where they, they kind of like, Oh, they're oh, great. They're great. I mean, I was, a, I was a rookie, but I was also the oldest guy on the team. Which was pretty funny. Uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Did you have a nickname? Uh, no, I did in college. I had several from old man to grandpa to right. Sarge to uh, whatever, but not really there. Nah. It's a little yeah. different, you know, NFL locker room versus college, but, but the Seattle, I would say Seattle's got that. Definitely got that college vibe. Mm-hmm. <laughs> more yeah. Than anything else. Yeah. So. And plus cool thing is, right down the road first special forces group. I know that they yeah. do a lot with, with first group. Uh, so yeah. Good buddy. Of mine, uh, who's still a good buddy named Ed Hall. Ed Hall. Um, I became close with, he's a first group guy and he just retired as a Sergeant major last year. And so he's a, he's a stud and uh, yeah. you know, we still, we stay in touch now, but um, yeah, I was actually, I was actually drafted by first group first drafted, you know, yeah. silly word, but I went yeah. to, uh, you know, my, that was the first, uh, I didn't go to Fort Lewis. So I was sent to Okinawa. They were Italian out in Japan and, and that's where I was. But, uh, yeah, I, I was, I started at first group and then kind of ended up out there too with the, with the Seahawks. Yeah. That, that's, that's a pretty cool story, especially like coming back home in in some sense, obviously you were in Okinawa. Yeah. But, uh, I don't know if you ever made it out to the Menton ball. Uh, but, <laughs> Um, so uh, not yet. Ed's always talked, it's talked about it before, but you gotta, you gotta go. I, 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 I I served in first group before I went to the Q course for like a year. That's cool. And, uh, my brother actually is also the other, the other group I spent most, oh, I spent, uh, time on active duty with the one I deployed with was 10th group Mm -hmm. out of Fort Carson. And, you know, the irony there is that the one preseason game I played in, it was, uh, we played the Broncos. So, oh. <laughs> yeah. yeah. The universe so is weird, isn't it? Yeah, it's strange. And they, they went on to win the Super Bowl that year, the, the Broncos, and Peyton Manning was the, uh, yeah. was the quarterback. And so I'm like, I'm like warming up in pregame. Uh, and up in Seattle, it was, a, it was a home game at Century Link. And I'm like snapping footballs now, like kind of just stand up for a second, try to take it in, like turn to my right and Peyton Manning's like <laughs> throwing routes to the receivers. I'm just like, Oh my gosh, like, what am I doing here? <laughs> this is crazy. Hall of Famer right there, man. Mm-hmm. Um, and I mean, you got to play with a bunch of future Hall of Famers as well. Uh, yeah. Hopefully. Um, so let's fast forward a little bit here. So 
staying on the NFL and, and obviously you, you were, um, I don't know, for lack of a better word, kind of conscripted into a bit of the, the, uh, social justice movement, um, through standing up and, and being a friend to somebody who probably needed one at the time. And obviously a controversial figure in Colin Kaepernick, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sat down, um, notoriously or famously sat on the bench instead of standing for the national anthem as a protest for police violence. And, um, as the story goes, you, you convinced him to take a knee because it's more respectful than, than sitting on your, um, your backside. Um, and walk me through how that changed your life. Well, you know, it was a, it was a year after I was in Seattle and, um, you know, the one game I got to play in, uh, when I stood on the sidelines and the anthem played, like I got super emotional and I understand that that's a lot of that's because of my connection to the flag in the anthem. Those, those symbols mean something different to me. Um, but it was just, uh, yeah, it was something that, um, I'll, I'll definitely never, definitely never forget. Um, moment I took your pride in and, um, and a year later, you know, I see Colin sitting on the bench and during the anthem. And at the time, initially, at least it didn't, it just hurt me, you know, more than anything. I was a big Niner fan growing up. I'm from the Bay. And, uh, I was like, man, this is like one of my heroes. And, uh, and, and but then I, you know, I listened to why he was doing it. I listened to an interview he'd done about, uh, in, you know, in the locker room shortly after and saying like, um, why he wasn't going to stand for the flag of a country that oppresses black people and people of color. And I didn't feel like that's, well, obviously that's not the intent of the flag, but it's also like not what I, my experience kind of uh, uh, understood. Like I, I get that, um, that we're absolutely, you know, equality does not uh, fully exist yet. And like, there's a lot to, to, to work towards and, and, uh, you know, we need, we need to improve in so many ways. And, um, but I, and maybe this was a bit of a wake up call for all those things. And, um, so I, I wrote this open letter because I kept getting hit up by everybody from the mm-hmm. media world about weighing in on this subject, I guess, because I played football and I was in the military. It makes me a subject matter expert, but, uh, <laughs> um, which it doesn't. And, uh, I, I, I agreed to write an open letter through the army times and, uh, and I did it and just kind of explained my relationship to those things and why I feel the way that I feel. And I talked about my trip to the Darfur and I talked about, you know, serving in the military and spending time in, in places where there is a sort of a different type of oppression and mm-hmm. or a different level of it, I guess. And, um, but also I was like, same time like i only know about my experience like for me to pretend that i know what it's like to be or go through what you've experienced like that's pretty ignorant and uh right. <laughs> colin read it and was actually inspired by it and reached out to me and wanted to meet so he asked if i could come down to san diego they were playing the chargers in the final preseason game that year and i did i went down there i met with him in the lobby of the team hotel we talked about all kinds of stuff, you know, and, and uh, sort of the end of the conversation after we really got to know each other and kind of knew where each other stood and kind of developed that respect and the mutual respect. He, he asked if there was another way that he could protest that wouldn't offend people in the military. Um, cause that was not his intent in any way. Right. And I told him, no, there's nothing you can do. That's not going to offend some people. <laughs> that's true. But, <laughs> um, you know, if, if you're asking my opinion, I think, the least inspiring part of what you're doing is that you're not alongside your teammates. You know, you're sort of isolated on your own. And, uh, you know, he agreed that that would be better if you be alongside his guys, even if they don't all agree with them. Like as soon as the anthem's over, the game starts and they go out on the field and, you know, they, they got to work together. Right. Even though they, they maybe disagree on some things. And so, um, I, I, I said, if you're alongside your teammates and you're committed to not standing, you know, the only other option that I think makes sense is taking a knee. And I think that's a, you know, that's a pretty respectful gesture, uh, throughout history. Mm-hmm. Um, 
And, uh, you know, if you're willing to do that, I'm willing to stand next to you. Uh, and he asked if I would kneel with him. And I, I told him, I, no, I wouldn't, like, I, I don't want to do that. Um, mm -hmm. but I, I, I'll support your decision to make that adjustment. And, uh, um, yeah, he, he thought that was, he agreed. I mean, he thought that was, that was cool. Uh, he, he uh, appreciated me, you know, willing to kind of be with him on it and support him in that way. And, you know, it didn't necessarily meant I supported right. everything that, that Colin said and did, you know, but it's right. like, right. I'm at least willing to have a conversation and try to figure some, figure out a solution together. Like we should do, in my opinion, we should do with everything in the, in the country. Yeah. Were you surprised by the reaction, both positive and negative? Yeah. I mean, right out the gate, man, there, when he took the knee, for instance, in the stadium, there was like a lot of booing. And this is, this is on military appreciation night. Like they had a right. flyover with like seals jumping in the stadium. And, um, the you know, was, a military town too. I, it's I grew a military up in town. Yeah. This was like, a, this was the, it was right around the 15th anniversary of nine 11 as well. That's right. So, yeah. It was, uh, it was pretty, pretty bizarre uh, to be completely honest, but, um, <laughs> But yeah, I mean, that, uh, it, no doubt changed your life. I'm sure small things change your trajectory yeah. in, in some sense. Yeah, for sure. Definitely. Yeah. But, um, I, and I guess that led to eventually, um, to you co-founding merging bets and players, right? Yeah. We'd already, we already actually started it. We, okay. we founded MVP in, uh, December of 2015. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, we bring together combat vets and former professional athletes and help them find purpose and uh, identity and, uh, you know, a, a, new, a team again when the uniform comes off. And, and it's so important, that identity. You're right. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, if anybody wants to check out more about that, it's it's vetsandplayers.org is a website. And um, we've got chapters in seven cities now. Um, and we've also got uh, a couple of Zoom options every week. And what we do when we meet up is we'll train for about 30 to 40 minutes mm -hmm. and, you know, just get a good sweat going. It's, it's something that everybody can participate in. If you are a, a combat vet or a former pro athlete, you're, you're able to become a member. Right. Um, and, uh, and then afterwards we just talk about our shit for back of a letter, lack of a better term. Yeah. Uh, you know, and just like, it, it can be good stuff too. It's just not, it's not all negative, but it's just, uh, um, sort of that community support group, you know, peer to peer. Um, so and just like, a, just like a locker room, man, it's, uh, I mean, we give each other crap, uh, but at mm -hmm. the same time, we, uh, you know, we've got crap we need to share and get off our chest. Like that's the place to do it. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, we'll make sure that that's in the show notes. And, uh, cool. again, I, I know we're, we we're going long here and I appreciate you taking the time, but I, I do want to get to, you know, what are some of the things you're working on? Obviously, uh, you're, you're hitting Hollywood by storm, uh, <laughs> director, actor, producer, all these things. And, and you had mentioned prior to recording um, a couple of projects that you work on. And if you, you don't mind enlightening us, let us know about those. Yeah. I mean, the big thing is I, I actually I directed a film um, called MVP about uh, about uh, it's a narrative too it's you know it's a scripted project with, with actors and everything and it's about uh, a, a homeless marine living in a shelter in east hollywood and he meets a uh, um he meets a former nfl player for sure out of the league and they're both kind of going through similar struggles on paper they got nothing in common but uh, once they get to know each other they realize they're they're more similar than they never imagined and uh, they got to they got to navigate the transition together and uh, it's cool, man. It was great. We had about half veterans on the cast and crew. Every veteran portrayed on screen is played by an actual vet. Wow. And uh, Sylvester Stallone put his name on it as an executive producer. And um, But then we've got like Tony Gonzalez and, and Michael Strahan and Howie Long. Um, oh, that, those are great dudes right there. Yeah. Randy Couture, <laughs> all these guys, Jay Glazer, they're all playing themselves in the wow. film. Um, and it's kind of their real stories uh, that come to life. Tom Arnold has a little cameo in it. And it's it's great, man. It was something we, we shot it in the middle of right in the middle of, 
of lockdown in LA. We figured a figured a way out to make it happen. Made it for nothing, but uh, yeah, we're uh, we're working on the distribution plan right now. Yeah, what what's that look like? When do you think uh, our folks will be able to? Hard to watch? say. Hard hard to say. I mean, I think hopefully in early next year, you know, but it's, yeah. uh, it's hard, it's hard to say until you do a deal. Yeah. I understand. I understand. Well, we'll keep, we'll keep the audience abreast. And you, you had mentioned also you're working on another, um, another project. So if you want to talk about it, we, we had talked before the show started here about being baseball fans and yeah. Yeah. Just working on a, working on a documentary that's, we just started. So that's going to take quite a while to get done, but, um, you know, it's about the, of the four pitchers in major league history to throw 20 strikeouts in a game, uh, which is a pretty incredible feat. And uh, so we're kind of collecting those stories right now on the road, talking to those guys. And, and uh, yeah, it's, I'm always a big sports fan. I've been one since I was a kid. Baseball was yeah. actually my first, first, very first love. Uh, Giants and, fan, uh, you said, right? Yeah. Giants fan. We had a good oh, year. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Was, you know, uh, I, I, I'm an NL West fan myself, Padres. Uh, and I, I'm happy about the giants winning the pennant because that means the Dodgers. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Um, well, let, they play tomorrow night though. Big game. Yeah. Yeah. I'm playing with the Cardinals who's, and the Cardinals are hot. Who's pitching? Uh, well, I would guess Scherzer, but I don't know. I mean, you want to put your best foot forward out there. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not sure who's who's up in that rotation, but that would be my guess. It doesn't matter. They're full of killers. <laughs> yeah, it's true. It's true. Yeah. Um, well, uh, as always, I kind of like to to close with, you know, you're you're a veteran. You've done quite a bit in your in your life to include transitioning from the military into the civilian world. Your story is unique, but I'm sure what's not unique is the um or at least what's applicable to everybody not just you is some advice that you could give veterans getting out of the military wondering what they're going to do trying struggling with their identity what's something you could relate to our audience about those subjects i think the number one thing is to just try things you know right just try different try different things don't don't limit yourself don't think because you did this that it's only going to translate to uh, kind of a narrow scope. Mm -hmm. Um, you can do freaking anything, man. That's what your skill set uh, uh, has prepared you for in the military and uh, specifically in a, you know, someone serving in, in the special forces, in, in my opinion, I mean, you know how to solve problems, you know how to, um, figure things out and you don't have to be a subject matter expert on anything, which I don't think I am still. Mm -hmm. Um, to, 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 to make it happen, you know, and if it's, it's, it should be whatever you're interested in, you know, whatever, um, kind of motivates you and, you know, gets you up in the morning and whatever you're excited about, it could be any field at, uh, like it's an, it's an open book, you know, and right. whatever that thing is. And if you don't know what that thing is, that's why I say, try things, you know, try different things that you feel like you might be interested in that may kind of move the needle for you. Don't be so hung up on like, Oh, I got to, you know, I got to do, I got to do something that directly re relates to my, mm -hmm. to my background or my MOS. I mean, that's, it's all BS, man. Like it, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. And people, um, because of your background and your story, you know, don't, don't throw your story in people's face or anything like that. But when they ask you, tell them the truth, tell them what you did, you know, tell them yeah. what you were a part of. Um, cause it does have value. Everybody, you know, go read somebody else's resume, you know, and tell me they're not bragging on themselves when you read that resume, <laughs> you know what I mean? And you, yeah. you can do it in a tasteful way. It doesn't mean I'm not saying go, you know, just brag about yourself, but like when people ask you, you know, well, who are you? What'd you do? You know, um, tell them, tell them what you can. I mean, you know, we've, we've, we've all <laughs> got certain information we don't necessarily need to share, but like, um, it holds a lot of weight. And so you got to use it. I think it's a disservice to yourself if you don't. Yeah. It's your story, right? Exactly. Keep writing it, man. Well, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, Nate, I appreciate your time. Uh, yeah. I know that you're a busy man and you got a lot of projects going on and, and keep doing, keep doing positive things, brother. And, and uh, keep trying new things, right? Who, who knows? 
maybe maybe you have a, a couple more surprises up your sleeve. And we'll see. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We'll see. I appreciate you joining us, man. Take it Thanks easy. Thanks for having me on, Cliff. I appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. Have a good one. All right. All right. So that was pretty cool getting to talk to Nate Boyer for as long as we did. He didn't have a, a whole lot of time scheduled for us, but he was able to stick around a little bit longer and hope I didn't uh, make him too late to his next appointment. Fantastic conversation. Great talking to Nate. He's just a fantastic and interesting character, really. Uh, I mean, he's a real human being, of course. He's a Green Beret, a football player, an actor, producer, all these things. And it was really great to hear some of the insight that he had to offer. And, and really what his message was is try new things. Go out there and don't let anybody tell you no. Just go out there. Do what makes you happy. Have fun with it. If you want to be a long snapper for a football team in a Division One college like the University of Texas, who's going to stop you? You could at least show up, try out. Maybe not you. Maybe not you. You're probably too old. But um, many of our other listeners, sure, go ahead. Go try it. See where it gets you. Um, very interesting to know that somebody as accomplished as traveled as interesting as Nate looks back at his life so far and says, man, I wish I could have done more. Makes you kind of think that what, what else could I do? What else could you do? Right. So great talking to him, love the conversation and, and hope to hear from again, him again soon and hope you enjoyed listening to it. Uh, if you haven't yet, Go ahead and subscribe to the podcast. Like us on Instagram. Follow us on LinkedIn. All the things. We have more content scheduled. We have a lot of guests coming up. And if, if nothing else, come visit us at veteranlife.com. And, uh, you know, we have a lot of really good information going up on the site. And can't wait to see you again. Take care, everybody. Mm-hmm.